think. Damn it. Everybody, welcome once again to Ormond Beach, Florida. This is Grassroots Motorsports Live, presented by CRC Industries and AutoBooks-AeroBooks.com. This is the 2017 Honda Civic Type R. That's right, folks. Right here in GRM Studios, live for you guys tonight. We're going to be taking a deep dive, uh, a look at this Honda Civic Type R tonight. Uh, I know everybody has been really, really jazzed for us to take a closer look at this car, and we are going to do that tonight. But before we get going here, I am going to go to my social media. I am going to click on this very video, and I am going to share it on my personal Facebook. I hope you will join me in doing the same. And now I'm going to switch over so I can not listen to myself so i can see everybody's comments if anybody has any questions any comments while we're looking over the type r feel free to post those in our facebook chat feel free to throw them in our youtube chat and we will get to those as quick as we can and let you guys know uh, what you want to know about the new civic type r all right let's start with the basics chris i will uh, let you get a, a shot of this, uh, shall we say, visually exciting automobile. Let's deal with first things first. The Civic Type R has a lot going on visually uh, for your eyes to take in, for, for your brain to, to drink in, uh, in, in the whole package here. We're, we're not going to we're not going to try and try and blow smoke up your skirt and say that uh, this is a, a a a simple understated automobile. It is absolutely not that. There's a lot going on here. Now, if you can get past that, uh, spoiler alert, flash forward. It's a fantastic car. You can't see any of this stuff from the driver's seat. That's that's what I will tell you there. If you can if you can get get past some of the some of the flair. Uh, both literally and figuratively, there's a phenomenal driving experience awaiting you behind the driver's seat of this thing. Let's look at a couple of the features here. Um, so we were lucky enough to be invited by Honda out to the uh, the media launch, and they, they 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 did make it a point to point out a few features that we're going to take a closer look at later when we get the car up in the air. Uh, there is actual brake cooling going on there, supposedly. We, we actually haven't had a chance to even get a wheel off, off of the, this car yet. Honda claims there is actual brake cooling taking place through some intakes up in, up in this area going to the brakes. And they also claim there is actual air extraction taking place through these vents back here that vents the fender, relieve some of the high pressure buildup caused by that spinning wheel from inside the, the fender here. Also... Yeah, there's a lot of dingle dangles and goo gahs and all, all kinds of stuff on it, but uh, the aero guys, just as much as the marketing guys, were involved in, in, in some of these processes. For example, the splitter they have on here. They actually sculpted the splitter to provide a little bit of a vertical fence outside the airflow channel right here, controls the airflow going around the side of the car. Spinning wheels are very, very turbulent. Um, so Whenever you can direct air around them in, in the proper fashion, it's advantageous to air, aerodynamics. So they actually sculpted this channel in here to, um, to, to account for that. And the same thing in the back back here. There's a little bit of a, of a sculpt here. Properly route the air around the back wheels. So again, uh, a, a lot of a very high volume of styling. But styling that sort of ultimately, you know, does something or at least mathematically can provide some benefits. For, uh, you know, we'll push the car forward a bit. We can take a look at the back because the back is maybe the most controversial part of the car. Uh, this enormous wing back here. 
but you've also, in addition to the wing, you've got some of these little turbulence generators here, which um, are, you know, a little exaggerated. It kind of reminds me of uh, something's going to turn into a robot and, and fight a giant monster at, at, at some point back here. But these little um, turbulence generators actually serve a purpose. And what they do is they break up the flow of air coming over the smooth top of a car, air that would normally stay, stay laminar, would, would, would stay attached to the surface of the car. They break up that flow, they lift the flow up a little bit, and they actually provide more airflow to a wing like this um, just, just by, by being back here. Interrupting that airflow, lifting the airflow off of this glass back here, directing it to the wing, where the wing can actually actually make it uh, make it do some good. You know, the the wing is um, needs to be designed as much for durability as it does for performance. But there is there is a bit of of, of an airfoil shape to it. Um, these. Side, uh, side fences are obviously very, very thick. Uh, on, on, a, on a race car, they'd be much thinner because all they're really there for is to prevent air from spilling off the sides and to make every, every bit of this wing as efficient as it, as it possibly can, can be. But on a production car, obviously, they have to be a little bit stronger, a little, little bit more durable, um, and they've, they've got to be in it for the long haul. So they're a little bit thicker, and uh, apparently there is a secret compartment hidden inside this wing where you can store contraband, so I hear. Um, I don't see it on this one though, on the, on the test cars there was like a little, little compartment in the bottom where I think something attached, but don't have it on this one. Um, again, a lot, lot going on back here. Uh, it's got the appearance of some diffuser paneling back there. There, there. there is no actual diffuser under under the car. This is this is just uh, style for the most part. But um, you know, look, I, I'm I'm not going to tell you. I, I'm I'm not going to sit here and say uh, there isn't a lot going on here. But I look. I've been married for 20 years. I got nobody left to impress. Everything I, I bring home, my wife just rolls her eyes and and you know, uh, wonders what the hell I was thinking anyway. So if you can, if you can get past this, and, and some of you may need to get past this, I, I, I see a lot of people in our world uh, who really claim to only, only care about lap times complaining about styling all of a sudden. And, and my, my point to them would be measure the car by its abilities, not necessarily by its looks. If, if you're judging me by my looks, I, you just sort of flip, flip your computer off right, right now. So extend the same courtesy to the automobile. Let's take a look inside here. Civic Type R is a hatchback built in England. You could actually take this car to a, uh, a British car meet and, um, you know, probably get kicked out. But te technically you would be correct. And we all know that being technically correct is the best kind of correct. Um, Got a couple of questions coming in. Uh, okay, we, we, we will uh, we will deal uh, with Taylor and Kelly. We'll, we'll we'll get to your questions in just a second as when we, when we move up front. Let's um, let's take a look in the back here. Ton of space in the back, and um, ton of space. Even once you fold these 70-30 seats down, they 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 fold nearly flat. Plenty enough room for a set of track tires. Um, and a jack and, and some tools and a cooler. So plenty of room for everything you, you would, would take to the track or to the autocross with you. Um, even if you're, you're changing tires at the track. Nice little, little feature here on, on the uh, sunshade. Uh, you know, I, I'm not somebody who's often impressed by sunshades, but this one is, is, is fairly cool. Nice little sunshade you can actually take the thing and move it over to this side I don't know what you would ever use that feature for but it fascinates me for for some reason I just think that is the uh, the most clever thing in the world all right so let's um let's cover some of these questions here 
Uh, Kelly wants to know, is the wing adjustable? No, as, uh, as it sits stock, the wing is not adjustable. Um, I, I have not seen any reliable downforce figures on, on this. My guess would be just, you know, knowing what, what I know about what manufacturers are, are allowed to do and, and what they are looking for in downforce. Uh, this wing probably is not so much generating a great deal of downforce as it is removing lift and turbulence from, from the back end. So I would say uh, a wing like this probably produces, you know, in, in the area of 80 or 100 pounds of downforce, which is mostly seen as, as the removal of lift from, from the back end. Um, but, uh, you know, create, creates a lot of visual excitement. Um, Lead Auto wants to know, would it benefit from a rear tower brace? Um, we'll have to take a closer look at the rear suspension once we get under there. I, without really seeing uh, what type of, of rear suspension, it's hard to make hard to make the decision as to, uh, to whether or not that would be necessary. I do know that uh, in regards to the difference in, in body between the Civic Type R and the Civic SI, for example, there are a lot of small but effective chassis stiffening methods that they use. You guys remember back to the Integra Type R uh, many years ago. Those cars were seam welded, they had lighter glass, than, than a regular Integra. Um, this does not go quite as far as that, but there is a lot of additional um, body adhesive used, which actually acts as, as a structural stiffener to uh, stiffen the, well, the structure of, of the car. And there's, there's a lot of, you know, sort of little detail changes. Man, I found this hood dealy earlier. It keeps disappearing on me in here. Ed, give me some, uh, give me some looking for the uh, the hood release music. Can you? There we go. Okay. So like most Hondas, um, it has not only the regular hood prop, but it has a uh, a service hood prop back here, which I always thought was a nice touch. Uh, two liter direct injected turbocharged and intercooled. Engine, 306 horsepower, driving through a six-speed manual transmission with a um, helical gear limited slip differential. Uh, you might, might also know that as a Torsen type differential. Torsen's actually a brand name. Uh, I don't know if this one is actually a Torsen brand, but um, uh, is, is the same, same mechanism or a si similar in, uh, in, in principle to the uh, Torsen differential. Um, just looking over, over top of the motor, um, not a lot of difference between this and, and the SI. The whole motor and transmission actually sits forward of axle line, which is, is generally, you know, the further back you can get it, Obviously, the better balance the car is going to be, but sometimes reality just prevents you from, from getting that motor back far enough. But it does look like Honda may have had a little bit of um, a little bit of space to move this motor back had they so chosen. But they've also got you know the the, the, the pressures of of an entire entire world full of full of uh, production for these these uh, Civic hatchback bodies that they have to account for. So. Understandable that they uh, they didn't do that. Um, engine mounts are always an issue on any front wheel drive car, and I would imagine the aftermarket is going to take a close look at at uh, not only the upper engine mounts here, but any any engine mounts back there that are that are keeping the engine from from doing this, um, because uh, that is always an issue in front wheel drive cars. You, these these engines, especially as, as horsepower and torque figures rise almost exponentially every, every year, putting more and more strain, uh, not just into, into engine and transmission components, but into the drivetrain as well. This engine is trying to twist itself right out of, 
out of the shell, and that can sometimes create binding issues with shifting. Anybody who's driven a Mazda Speed 3 knows that when you're under power in a car like that, there's crazy shift bind issues. We've never experienced that in, in our, our admittedly limited testing with uh, the Civic Type R, but owners we've talked to, actually, uh, we've, we, we've not really uh, gotten word that there are a lot of shift binding issues. The only issues we've actually heard of as far as shifting is an occasional grind on, on the one, two shift. And uh, that, that can, again, this is just anecdotal evidence. The, you know, the, this, is, this is not tons of research, but we have, we have heard some owners, uh, especially autocrossers, talking about a little bit of grinding on the one, two shift that can be alleviated just by sort of changing the timing your clutch depression and your pull of the shifter. You get your foot into the clutch a little bit sooner and do your pull of the shifter later and changing the timing on that seems to be fairly good. All right, let's take a look. Uh, we've got some questions backing up here. By the way, thanks very much for all the, uh, all the likes and all the shares. Um, we, uh, we really appreciate that. Okay, so uh, Brian wants to know what kind of brakes. We're going to take a look at that uh, shortly, Brian. We're going to get the thing up on the lift, pull the wheels off, take a close look underneath, and um, take a look at, uh, at the brakes. Um, uh, so Sasha says he could keep, uh, keep his 10-year-old in the trunk and get rid of the wing and have the same downforce. Well, technically, but your 10-year-old also adds mass. So while you would, you would still have the same uh, amount of weight pushing down on the rear end, you would actually have additional mass in the car, and you'd have, you'd have unfixed mass. So when you went into a corner, that mass of your 10-year-old would actually slide over. It would, it would be a, a you know, moving mass. It would have inertia. It would upset the balance of the car. Probably upset uh, your 10-year-old your, your as well. So you might not want to do that. Uh, Kevin wants to know, how far back does the rear wing and spoiler sit as compared to the rear bumper? Good question. Um, Let's take a look. It actually sits, yeah, it sits quite a bit inside the rear bumper. It actually uh, sits fairly even with the rear hatch here. So, you know, no, no issues if you were to, to back it into a post. Um, I don't know why you would do that, but if you were to back it into a, a straight solid object, you would, uh, you would definitely hit bumper first. You've got, you've got probably a good three or four inches of bumper to compress there. Um, Angela says uh, she loves hers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we we have not heard many people uh, who 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 have purchased these who do not like them. Um, and we've also we also know a few people that have bought them for uh, not that much over list. There was a lot of gouging by dealers going on when these things first hit the market. Uh, there was there was people there were dealers trying to get you know tens of thousands of dollars over list price. So list price, uh, MP is like just under $34,000. Not many really, if any, I understand now there are people uh, who, who were buying cars for well under $40,000. Um, so just a little bit of a premium. Uh, so Tane wants to know, uh, did the Type R run the GRM 2017 Challenge autocross course? Yes, it did. Uh, we have video of that coming up in just a few minutes. Um, and uh, it was high, highly competitive, even on its OEM street tires. Okay, before we go to that, let's take a look inside the car. And then when we go to the video, uh, we'll, we'll throw it up on the lift while we're showing you guys the video of our driving impressions and um, our autocross impressions. But I wanna show you a couple things inside the car here. So we'll bring Chris around, turn our cabin lighting on. Oh my God, Chris, I just broke your light. Well, here, let's look at the back seat, because the back seat now contains some auxiliary lighting. So, Unlike uh, other Civics, back seat in the Type R is, is two-place. It's got cup holders and a divider in the middle. Um, if you're one of those two people, you're very comfortable. You have lots of leg room. I know there, there has been some, um, 
discussion and some, some dislike in the fact that there is not a bench in the rear, so it's not really a five-place car. It's a, it's a true four-place automobile. But, um, you know, I guess, uh, I guess you just have to leave that extra kid home. Front seats, similar in overall shape to the SI, but much more highly bolstered and actually have some pass-throughs for, um, for seat belts there in the upper shoulders. Nice Alcantara suede upholstery on, on the seats. The seats are, are very, very grippy. You'll see that when you get in the car, and, and you do have to drop down into the car a little bit more than you do in the SI, but uh, you also generally have to adjust your shirt a little bit because the seat is very, very grippy itself. All right, let's fire it up here, and we'll... Uh, Show you some of the different modes you can you can go into in the car. Make sure. Uh... So, the first thing everybody wants to know is, can you entirely disable the traction control and the stability control? The answer is yes, and the answer is uh, not only can you do it, it's also much easier to do than it is in the SI. If you go back to our SI video a couple weeks ago, we take you through the entire dance of the pedals and how you, how you turn the uh, stability control and the traction control off. On the Type R, it's even easier. The Type R has a mode switch right down here that can put it in one of three modes. Now, hey, Chris, can you see right up here on the, on the dash? Uh, your default mode is sport mode. You can rock it back once to go into comfort mode, or you can rock it forward to go into plus R mode. So, what changes in those three modes is uh, shock damping is, is probably the, the big thing. Uh, comfort is a little softer, sports right in the middle, plus R is your firmest, your most responsive shock damping. Steering response also changes in plus R mode. Steering is a little heavier, provides you a little more feedback through that electric power steering pump. And the throttle mapping changes as well, which is, to be honest, my favorite part of the different modes. In plus R mode, the throttle mapping is, is darn near linear, whereas in, uh, in, in comfort mode and even in sport mode, it's a little more uh, logarithmic. It's, you, know, you have to get deeper into the throttle to get full throttle. But in plus R mode, it's just incredibly responsive and really, really fantastic on track. You also have some really neat, uh, oh, so, so let me show you how to, how to turn the track control off. So basically the, 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 the easy mode is put the thing in plus R mode, put your foot on the brake and hit and hold the track control button for about five seconds and boom, vehicle stability assist system fully off. There you go. So there is, there is your, uh, your track mode, your autocross mode, what have you. Also has some great options for dash displays. There's a button right here that um, lets you cycle through various dash displays. You've got one here that's basically a progressive shift light. Uh, you know we can't rev it up high enough in the in the garage to show you, but here actually, Chris, if I close the door, will you be able to shoot through the window? Okay. So we got a nice progressive uh, shift light in one mode. We can go to another mode and see all of the info on turbo boost or vacuum pressure, as, as it were. We can go to yet another mode and see throttle percentage on one side and um, uh, boost on, on the other side. And then we've got a cool G meter mode, shows us lat lateral and longitudinal Gs. And then we've got a stopwatch mode. Um, so all kinds of really, really cool additional uh, information modes there right in the driver information center. Um, let's go through a couple of our questions here. I know we got a big crowd tonight. So Angela says the exhaust is too quiet. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Um, it... Uh, it, it definitely does need some exhaust work. We'll see, it's got kind of an interesting 
you know, triple exhaust outlet set up back there. I'm curious to get under the car and see exactly how that works. Uh, Colin says there's too many doors. I tend to agree. So a couple weeks ago, we had a Civic Si. It was a two door with a trunk. Um, it, it was it was just the right size. Like still had plenty of back seat. Still had a nice big trunk. Um, I would love to see this package applied to, to that car. I, I, I tend to agree. Uh, Mike wants to know, do I fit in comfortably? Yeah, I fit in beautiful, man. Like, like, so I get into it a little bit on our driving impressions, but for me, if you're talking about this car, you're talking about Civic Type R, uh, Golf R, Focus RS, and Subaru WRX STI. And of those four cars, uh, this and the Golf, I, I think, for, for me personally, stand out as, as the best driver cars, uh, the most comfortable, the most functional. This, like the SI, has the same fantastic sight lines, uh, the same openness in, in, the, in the interior. So I just knocked Chris's light over again. Um, Jake says it's a great car. Yeah, we, we don't disagree. Um, Sasha says uh, there's nothing on that car that isn't overdone. Good design requires editing and restraint. Yes, uh, you know, I, I cannot necessarily say that you are entirely wrong there. There, there, is, there is not a single part of this car that has not been designed. And in, 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 some, in some ways that works out for them, and in some ways it just kind of turns into overkill. For, for example, look at, um, Chris, look at, look at the dash, if you can, kind of, kind, of, kind of get a shot in there. You've got these, uh, these, these red, red stripes, the, these red LED stripes, you, you've got these um, sort of curved bar graphs for the temperature and the fuel gauge. And you look at them and they, they look pretty cool, but I don't know how well that styling is going to age. It's, it's actually fairly retro. Like there were Mitsubishis in 1988 that had very similar design language go, going on in, in, in some of the details. So I, I'm, I'm a little worried that some of the, the overstyled pieces of this car are, are not going to age quite as well. Um, but, uh, you know, we'll see. So Mike wants to know, uh, do we think it needs a bigger rear sway bar like most Hondas? Uh, the immediate answer was Carceps is developing one. Yes, Carceps is developing a, uh, a rear sway bar that adjusts from, I believe, 20% stiffer to over 100% stiffer than the factory bar that's that's in there um and the initial testing is is highly favorable we had a question a little while ago about uh tire size what's the biggest tire you can fit underneath there what we've seen so far in street class autocrossers is you can fit a 285 all the way around the hot setup so far appears to be a 285 19 in the front uh, car comes with 245 3020s in the front. The, the hot setup appears to be going to a little taller sidewall and a little taller overall tire, but a lot more tire with a 285 in the front. Fits with little to no rubbing on, no rubbing on any metal, tiny little bit of rubbing on some plastic. Uh, with, paired with a 245 in the rear, so a bigger tire in the front, stock diameter in the rear. Bigger tire in the front does a couple of things for you. It gets you more contact patch on the ground, um, and it also gets you a little more diameter. Uh, you go up from a, about a 26 inch tall tire stock to about a 27 inch tall tire, which gives you a little bit longer second gear and a little bit more flexibility in those gears. Um, So Colin says he is a, uh, a CRX guy. Yeah, I used to own a CRX myself, and you know this definitely uh, t takes me back to to my CRX days. Um, you, you know, you can. Yeah, a Angela says you can you can sit in it, and it feels like your other Civics. You definitely feel the Honda DNA in this car. Uh, it is it is readily apparent. Okay, uh, we are going to go now live via satellite to. Um, if I remember how to do this, to our special correspondent, who is uh, me. And we're gonna give you some driving impressions on the car. So let me shrink 
this me down and let me expand the other me. JG, can you hear me? Hello? Are you there? Hello? Yeah, I've been here. I've been waiting on you. So we're doing the thing again where it's day there, but it's night here and we're still live, okay, doing, but I'm talking to you somehow. You pretend is that, is that, that how? I'm live and you're there. Not, not funny then, not much more funny now. Can we just do this, please? Okay, thank you. Hi, everybody. Okay, just, Welcome dude, to just show us the Civic Type R. The Honda Civic Type R. We pull out onto the road here, give you guys a few quick driving impressions of the Civic Type R. So a couple weeks ago, we talked about the Honda Civic Si. The Type R, additional 100 horsepower, actually additional 101 horsepower, I believe. Uh, about the same weight, maybe a couple of pounds heavier. Comes in right around 3,100 pounds. Um, here's the biggest difference, or actually the, 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 the biggest thing you notice between the Civic Si and the Civic Type R. And that's how little penalty you pay for the additional performance of the Type R. Now, there's certainly a financial penalty. The Civic Type R is a good twelve to fifteen thousand dollars more expensive than the SI but for the additional hundred horsepower for the additional chassis tuning for a, a nearly completely different type of front suspension and for the additional performance available there's really no trade-off in harshness or daily livability with the Civic Type R versus the Civic Si. This is still a car that is 100% livable on an everyday basis. It, 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 it gives you access to all 306 horsepower whenever you want to put your foot down. And when you don't want to put your foot down, it's a fantastic car to just drive around everywhere. The seats are comfortable. They're a little more heavily bolstered than the Honda Civic Si's type uh, seats, but they're not restrictive. They're not uncomfortable. The Type R still has that fantastic low belt line, which is a rarity in cars today. It's it, it's so rare to have these these uh, window sills down below your neck. You know, it, it's so nice to be able to see all four corners of the car so well. Uh, on the autocross course, the car is just a joy because you have this great sense of where all four corners of the car are. So, uh, here, here is the, here, here is for me the big thing. The, the, the first question that comes up when people are asking about the Civic Type R is how does it compare to the Focus RS, the WRX STI? You know, which, which is a better car? The answer on which is a better car is a highly subjective answer because you need to define what standards you're actually using for your term better. Uh, how, how are you asking it to be a better car? If you're asking me personally, which car do I prefer of those three? Maybe even throwing the uh, the Volkswagen Golf Type R in there. Um, it, it, this one, hands down, and I'll tell you the main reason why, because the performance of the Civic Type R, I think, is absolutely the most accessible of any of this class of cars right now more so than the Focus RS. Absolutely, the Focus RS has a very polarizing interior. Great chassis, fun chassis, drivable chassis to some extent, but the instant hop in it and go fast and have fun is not there with the Focus, Focus uh, RS that it is in the Civic Type R. The other thing that the Focus doesn't have is it doesn't have the comfort that this car does, and it doesn't have the, the usability and user friendliness that the Civic Type R does. The WRX SDI is starting to get a little bit dated. Um, technology is beginning to, to pass it up a little bit. Still a great chassis, still, still a great motor, but um, clearly not on the cutting edge like this car is. Uh, if, you're, if you're asking me to, to, to tell you what I think is the closest to this car in terms of performance and scope and, and capabilities, probably the Golf R. Um, I, I, I still prefer this car as a driving experience to the Golf R. I, I think it, 
it's I think it's more user friendly. I think it has enough of an edge to be fun, but that edge is is not at all punitive. Um, the Golf R also a very sophisticated, you know, very comfortable car. But boy, this 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 car just brings it's all the fun of the Civic Si um, with a hundred more horsepower. <laughs> 100 horsepower, 100 additional horsepower, 306 horsepower is absolutely nothing to sneeze at. Corvettes had, it was a big deal when Corvettes had 300 horsepower, and that was not so long ago. It was a big deal, you know, when the, the, the Turbo Supra had 300 horsepower, and the Twin Turbo Nissan 300ZX, that was a big number, and now it is in the front of a Civic Type R. How awesome is that? All right, so here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna flip this thing around. Um, so I've been driving on, on public roads this, this whole time. The car is quiet. Um, we can switch switch modes here. We can go into plus R mode. You know, it, it's not harsh. Now, if you live in Michigan, if you live someplace where there's a ton of potholes, maybe that's gonna be different for you. But overall, the driving experience is one that you could easily live with every day of your life and and never ever ever be sad I'm going to turn around in this fire station here head back the other way go through the gears here a little bit so the thing i most want to compare this to is the civic si we had a couple of weeks ago and there are a few differences that, that you, you you notice right off. First off, the uh, the shift action is a little bit tighter. The shifter feels a little more substantial than it did on the Civic Si. The Civic Si had a nice, clean, crisp shifting action, but the shifter felt uh, you know a little uh, uh, a little fine, a little uh, I I don't want to. You know, use use words that that make it sound cheap or light, but there was almost a, a, a fragile lightness to it. Um, that especially when you were shifting and angry and rowing those gears really hard, uh, it, it just sort of made your hand want a little more resistance, a little more substantial feeling. Civic Type R really, really nails the feeling of um, of some resistance, but with a very positive motion as well. Likewise. The steering is phenomenal. Uh, it 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 feels like um, very communicative, very uh, very direct. You can you can sit back and cruise on the highway and steer with one hand, or you can drive the thing like a race car and stay at ten and two and just get this very very positive connection to the road. Other thing I like about this car quite a bit, especially for track use, is the automatic down. Uh, the, uh, automatic blip system on on downshifts. We'll show you how that works. We're in third gear. We're gonna hit the brakes, go down into second gear, let the clutch back out. Nice and smooth. Don't have to worry about heel and towing. Yes, I know heel and towing is a fantastic skill to learn and it makes you look cool and it impresses people. And But you know what? If a computer can do it better than me and I can go faster around a racetrack, I'm gonna let that computer do the hard work while I do the fun work. Of just driving the ass off of this thing so I'm gonna give you a little demonstration here of the acceleration capacity of the Civic Type R first first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna pull over and uh, we're gonna turn the traction control completely off we showed you how to do that in the um, Civic SI we'll go through the same so the thing I really want you to pay attention to when we launch the car is not necessarily how fast it is. It is fast, sub five seconds, zero to 60, but how little torque steer there is in, in this chassis because of Honda's use of a couple of cool technologies like their uh, double ball joint front suspension um, and whatever other tuning they have done in the front end. Absolutely fantastic. Just brilliant. So we're gonna come to a stop. We're gonna put it in gear take my hands completely off the wheel. And the thing is dead straight. I mean, absolutely dead straight. I, I had to grab the wheel because the road turned a little bit. And unfortunately, the car cannot control the road. So uh, folks, that is our, our on-road 
assessment of the Honda Civic Type R. I'm gonna go now to uh, me again at the autocross course with the Civic Type R. This was uh, shot a couple days ago at Gainesville, Florida at our 2017 challenge. And we are going to um, give you the, our impressions of the car from behind the wheel at the autocross. So we will see you in just a second with the helmet on. Hi everybody, uh, here with a helmet on, pulling up into line at the autocross uh, at our Grassroots Motorsports 2017 Challenge, where we've co-opted the course a little bit to do a little bit of autocross testing with the 2017 Honda Civic Type R. Now we have everything off. We have the car in uh, in in plus R mode. Then we turned everything off. Uh, we showed you the instructions on the Civic Si a couple weeks ago, how to turn the traction control and the stability control off. So we'll see if we can get all 306 horsepower to the ground here during an autocross run. Thanks, sir. understeer on power a little bit but it doesn't really wash out and completely lose the front end the diff does a great job at keeping the power going to the ground though lost a little bit there but a nice transition back to the power a little bit of turbo lag in the really 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 tight stuff but overall very competent would have been about Oh gosh, third or fourth fastest of uh, any of our $2,000 $2, challenge cars here. Yep, I've been here. I've been waiting on you. Hey, we're back, everybody. Um, we, uh, okay, so that, that was, yeah, that was our driving impressions. Um, let me throw this away before everything goes haywire and we'll take a, a little break here while we're talking uh, first off thanks for watching the show tonight I know this is a different night than we're normally on normally grassroots motorsports live presented by CRC industries is on every Wednesday evening um, here from beautiful KGRM studios in Ormond Beach Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern we're here every week doing awesome stuff. We're going to be back this Wednesday night with a, a living legend, Terry Irwood, former Skip Barber instructor, current instructor at the new Level Up Driving School. And I, I mean, the, the, the man is a damn national treasure is, is, is what he is. We are honored to be able to uh, bring him over to the studio this Wednesday and hang out in have a chat about all things motorsport with Terry Irwood. Also want to tell you guys a little bit about uh, our friends at CRC, the presenting sponsor of this show. Folks, before every show, we do a couple of things. We, uh, we go and we lubricate all of the joints in our fancy little steady cam there with CRC Power Loop, and we go around and we clean all the lenses and all of our LCD screens with uh, CRC's display cleaner. And we have got that awesome, it's behind the car now, you can't see it, but if the car wasn't so high, you'd see our giant shelf of CRC stuff over there. You know what, it's not just there because they support the show. We have, come on, come on over Chris, you got a mobile camera platform. Got a giant shelf of CRC stuff over here. Now, if they weren't supporting the show, it wouldn't be so quite so neat and organized, but we were using this stuff way before they were supporting the show because it's awesome stuff. And if you like our show, if you like what we're doing and you need automotive chemicals, you know, throw a bone to somebody who's helping out what you love because CRC, not only is it fantastic stuff, whether you're looking for lubricants or obviously brake clean, everybody knows about brake clean or intake cleaner, carb cleaner. If you're looking for automotive chemicals, you buy CRC stuff, you're getting not only a fantastic chemical, you're supporting a company that supports the world that you exist and have fun in. Also, check out our friends at Autobooks Aerobooks, autobooks-aerobooks.com. Awesome old brick and mortar bookstore in Burbank, California with uh, the ability to order everything they have. 
tens of thousands of books, DVDs, uh, magazines, uh, automotive, motorcycle, airplane, boats, uh, right off their webpage at autobooks-aerobooks.com. Also, they have a fantastic calendar of all the automotive events in Southern California. So if you're in SoCal looking for cool car stuff to do, check out autobooks-aerobooks.com and uh, you know, it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't kill you to read a book once in a while. All right, so let us take a look underneath the thing here. Um, so Sasha says, uh, we'd love to see it on track. That would really shine on something not so tight. Uh, agreed, we actually have track footage from when we went and did the uh, the press preview for the car, and we will throw that on our YouTube page um, here before before too long. I, I totally forgot to cut some of that into our uh, our, our cutaway there. Um, Andrew Collins says uh, looked good through the autocross, dude. Okay, so here here let me before we go any further. Let, 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 me, let, me, let, me, let me break it down for you people here. If you slapped a $100 bill on, on the table and said you get one autocross run in a car you've never driven before and I'm laying, laying $100 on the line, um, you know, you versus whatever, what car do you want? Right here. Hands down, right here. Uh, the closest I would, I would come to this is maybe the Golf R. But as far as being able to access the greatest amount of this car's performance and potential, this car does an absolutely masterful job of that. It is, it's really impressive how much you feel like you are, you are connected with the car and, and how much the car is connected with the ground and how much of that feedback you, you get back to your hands and your butt and your feet through, through the pedals. It's really, really impressive. Uh, let's see. So yeah, the, the Type R was actually, um, we were like third or fourth fastest uh, among all the autocross cars. The, the only cars faster than us were on, were on Hoosiers, basically. There was like a supercharged Miata. On Hoosiers, there was a uh, you know like uh, well, a Honda Insight with the Subaru motor in the back on on Hoosier slicks, uh, and we were on our our stock our OEM uh, like 240 Treadwear Continentals. Let me see if I can find the Treadwear number here somewhere. Yeah, two two forty. These are um, Continental. Oh, I don't know the model. Ed, Ed, Ed'll find the model. They're uh, you know whatever the, the 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 good Continental summer tire is now. But um, you know, for, yeah, a Continental Sport Contact Six for a for a um, you know for a street tire. They were fantastic. Okay, so we got some questions here. Uh, Pete says it's like making love in a dark room. Just keep your eyes closed. Uh, oh yeah, I'm looking at the car, dude. You can't see the car from the driver's seat. You know, whatever. It, like, it, I, I, I've never, I've never heard so many people who who claim to be uh, pr primarily concerned with performance complain about looks. That's that's my view on this car. So let's take a look at a couple of things when we pull the wheels off here. Um, so if you tuned in a couple weeks ago and saw our, our breakdown on the Civic Si, you remember that the upper strut mounts have a pin in them that you're allowed to pull uh, to, to adjust, adjust camber. The folks we've talked to with Civic Type R's are all reporting that with that pin pulled um, and as much camber as they can throw into the car, they are getting about 1.6 to 1.8 degrees of negative camber from from tilting these uh, these struts back as far as they can. Okay, front brakes, uh, four piston Brembos with vented and cross drilled rotors that are. 
throw the tape measure on here. Uh, about 14 inches in diameter, so a fairly beefy rotor in the front. Um, I'm going to put the car up a little bit further here so we can take a look at this double ball joint suspension. So if you guys watched the, the video of the, of the car on the road, you saw me accelerate uh, without my, my hands on the wheel. And that was not bull crap. That was not, you know, that was not uh, special effects. It was not like orcs and goblins that we green screened into that to make it look convincing. That was the real deal. And a big part of that lack of torque steer is this double ball joint arrangement here. So in a traditional strut, what you have is You've got the strut that, uh, that comes down, you've got a knuckle that extends off, off, off the strut, and then you've got the, uh, the hub suspended from a single knuckle. So what that does is, let me find a straight edge here. Might be able to explain this a little better. Hang on, Chris. Uh, Ed, some, some straight edge finding music, please. Thank you. I, I keep thinking there's going to be a music. Yeah, I keep thinking there's going to be a music cue or some sort of a cutaway, but it's never going to happen. Okay, so in a traditional strut car, you've got the strut that comes down straight like this, and you've got a hub hanging off the strut. So when the car turns, the whole strut has to rotate. So what ends up happening is you you've got what's called a scrub radius that that's created. The, if you extend the point down from the strut where it would contact the ground and compare that to what would be the center of the contact patch of, of the tire, unless you've got the strut at a really crazy angle, you're, you're going to have a, a difference between where, that's, where the natural line of that strut would intersect the ground. So the, the, uh, the virtual line around which that strut is pivoting, you have a difference between that and the center of of your tire, it's called, it's called scrub radius. And you can, you can actually use that to your advantage in, in some situations, but generally the closer you can get that to zero, the easier it is to make the car handle well. So Honda does that by adding a, a basically a, a moving knuckle out here. They add a, a whole separate assembly here with an upper and lower ball joint, and then they pivot the, uh, the, the steering around these two ball joints so they're able to basically create a zero scrub radius. You can follow, you can draw a line between the upper and lower ball joints here and it basically intersects the center of the contact patch of those tires. So it actually becomes almost like a hybrid of an A-arm front suspension and a strut front suspension, at least from, from a steering or, or, or scrub radius um, type arrangement. Also, has a fantastic effect on eliminating torque steer, as, as you guys saw in the demo. Let me uh, get back to my phone here and take a look, uh, see if we have any questions. Uh, Colin says, uh, you've never heard performance guys complain about looks. Remember the introduction of the Dell Soul. Yeah, okay, yeah, you, you, you got me there. Um, All right, so another big question is about brake ventilation. So we actually do have some brake ventilation in, in this car. This is a vent coming from the front, uh, but it actually, uh, Chris, come around front here. So this here, this is all styling. This is all um, visual excitement. This is your, your, in, your intake for, for your, your, your brake here. So this panel is just here to provide some texture. Um, you know, provide a uh, little bit of something to, to break up what, what, what would otherwise be just a, you know, a giant flat bumper. And then here's where your, your brake intake air comes in here, comes out here, provides some cool air in, into that fender. Uh, we also have some cool, some air going into the fender here and then air being extracted out of the fender from behind, yeah, from behind this liner here, 
can actually see the extraction point coming through these, these vents here. And then there's another extraction point, sorry, Chris, another extraction point right here for the air. What happens in, in a, a, a car when you've got a sealed wheel well, that wheel spins, it creates a lot of high pressure air under the wheel well. And we, and we know whenever there's high pressure air under a car, it's basically creating lift. So if you can vent that high pressure air out from under the car, uh, it's, it's gonna reduce some of that lift. It's, it's gonna you know, help create, create better handling. And um, since we have the air coming in here to cool the brakes, you gotta get that air back out too. Doesn't matter how much air you get into something, if you can't get the same volume of air back out of the same area. That's very important to remember when you're trying to keep something cool. You know, you can, you can duct all kinds of air to your radiator, Unless you can get that air back out of the other side of the radiator, not never going to keep the car cool. Same goes for brakes. Um, up front here, we've got the front mounted intercooler right behind the front grill, right in the airstream. Actually, the, uh, the AC condenser is right behind there, but this, this heat exchanger right here is the front mounted intercooler. Uh, front mounted intercooler, obviously, from a labor standpoint, a lot more complex to install in a car, especially a car on a production line. So kudos to Honda. For, for putting this intercooler right in the airstream, uh, cools the intake charge, provides a little more horsepower than you otherwise would have. All right, let's check uh, for some questions here. Get a, got a big crowd tonight. Thanks very much for, um, for joining us. Uh, so, okay, so we got, um, oh, uh, Chris, they wanna see a, sh a couple more shots of the front suspension. Can, can you come on back under here where I am and get him a better shot of this knuckle arrangement? There we go. So that's the shot everybody wants to see of that double ball joint front suspension arrangement. Uh, let's see. Brian wants to know if that's an oil cooler on the right side of the front grill. Uh, oh, actually, this is interesting. So on the, uh, that's over there is, uh, is actually horn. Um, so there, there is an opening in that side of the grill, um, but there is no opening in the driver's side of the grill. And do we see oil cooler up there? Yes, I did actually go to grab a stool because the car is up too high for me at this point. Uh, don't see oil cooler back there. Doesn't mean there isn't one. We'll look around a little bit more for it. But yeah, that is, that is horn right there. Um, so obviously they have to have some, probably some federally mandated standards, um, you know, for, for uh, getting for nothing blocking the horn. Fairly slick underside here. I think somebody actually made a, uh, made a comment about that, um, that the underside is, is pretty slick and tidy. And yeah, it certainly is. Uh, Sasha also wants to know how much uh, to remove to get to the oil and filter. Um, if you go back to our Civic SI video, we actually, we're, we're, we're not gonna do it again because it's basically the same panel, but uh, you, you just remove this panel right here, this, this aluminum protection panel, and you can get to the uh, oil drain plug in the oil filter extremely easily. And I think there was, there's like two big screws right here. And then there's uh, about half a dozen of these quarter turn fasteners to remove this panel. It, it, it you know, first time we did it, it took us a couple minutes to figure it out. But once you, once you understand how to do it, it's a two minute job to, uh, to take, take that, um, take that panel off. Uh, combination of metal and plastic under here, of course this is an aluminum panel here. This, uh, these fill panels are all plastic. This is all plastic. This heat shielding is uh, aluminum. And this is actually all plastic under here controlling the airflow. And, and boy, the underside of this thing is, is just phenomenally slick. They've actually done, done a lot of work getting the air to move to move under this thing uh, properly. Um, 
did a really, really good job there. So actually, interesting shot here, if you are thinking about doing your own service, um, the, the side skirts hang a little bit lower than the, um, the body seams here. So luckily our lift had enough, uh, enough of a height difference that it, it's not really putting any pressure on, on the side skirts. But if, if you're going to jack this up, you know, be conscious of where you're jacking it up because the, the skirts are a little bit lower than, than these, uh, these, these seams here. So there is body work that hangs down below there. All right, so let's take a look at the uh, let's take a look at the exhaust first because this is this is fairly fascinating. So we've got single exhaust coming I'll blow the light in Chris's face. Single exhaust coming all the way back that then splits into three sections. Um, so you've got three separate resonators that you've got an independent path uh, coming out of each resonator and then joining again into into this triple outlet so what is what is going on there they're, they're basically trying to control sound output and and get to a very specific sound output level so you have to remember when when you're dealing with exhaust the exhaust comes out in pulses i think of think of exhaust as um as a uh uh, you know, a really, really hard-shouldered sine wave, uh, or, or almost as a square wave, um, if, if you're thinking about it in terms, in terms of, of waveform. You have basically these individual pulses that are that are coming coming out of the exhaust. So, you, so you've got you, you've got basically a, you know a, a a wave of hot gas followed by nothing in in the in-between times when the, when the cylinder doesn't fire then another wave of hot gas behind that and so on and 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 so forth and since you've only got one exhaust outlet here you've got you've got all of those those waves of exhaust gas uh, exhaust gas um, following each other out here well eventually they've got to go through some twists and turns so the, uh, the those waves are going to start to bump into each other the further back they get because they're going to start compressing and they're going to start, you know, it, 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 it's going to be like bumper to bumper traffic. If everybody's going the same speed, it's great, but you start to get some, some curves in, in the road and the front guy slows down a little bit because of those curves and everything starts to accordion. So that's where, the, that, that's where these, these resonators come in. You try, and, you try and unrestrict that flow and let all of those waves go different places and not, not bump into each other or strategically bump into each other uh, to create you know, exactly the, the, the amount of sound and, and back pressure from, from the exhaust that you, you want. So uh, you know, I can't speak to the, what the, the actual tuning effect was here, but they were probably looking for a very specific sound and uh, a, 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 a very, um, very sort of specific uh, noise versus power output that was was going to be applicable to to the widest market possible. Now, now the good news is you could easily re, you know re replace this um, with uh, with a, 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 a cat back exhaust. Um, you've got a couple of resonators in here. And I'm guessing that's probably the like a pre-cat. So yeah, you would have to cut somewhere in here, but you could replace all that, cut some weight out of it, and um, and probably up the horsepower. All right, got a couple questions about the wheels. Is there a, a brand on the wheels? Uh, good question. Let's take a closer look at one of these 20-inch wheels. See if we see a brand. Uh, I see Honda Motor on there, so I'm guessing it's uh, either a Honda wheel or, or more likely uh, something Honda has made under contract uh, from a company that has decided not put their name on it. Now, uh, Angela, if you're still out there listening, uh, you have found um a fantastic autocross setup for for the wheels on this car and um 
I'll, I'll let I'll let you share that uh, if if you're still there before I um, before I spoil the fun, uh, and then we'll take a look at the uh, the rear suspension here. Oh, I see Ed getting up. Okay, <laughs> Ed just getting up to walk around. All right, so let's take a look at the rear suspension. So uh, fairly similar to the um, the Civic Si, we've got upper and lower control arms. So somebody asked earlier about uh, whether a strut bar would, would help out. Um, you know, not really because the, the upper and lower control arms both mount to this subframe right here. They don't really mount into the unibody, which is what you'd want to stiffen if you were adding a rear, a rear strut bar in there. You don't really have struts in the back. So I, I don't see a ton of advantage to stiffening the rear, rear unibody. Um, since there are, since these, this is an upper and lower arm effect. Uh, this probably headlight height sensor or just a suspension motion sensor. It probably actually reads, uh, you know, it probably actually uh, affects several different, different functions. Like uh, it's probably wired into the um, stability control system where, where it reads rear suspension motion. Also probably senses the height of the rear suspension to compensate for uh, headlight alignment. Um, there is some camber adjustment available in the back. I'm going to switch hands here for a second. So yeah, we've got some camber adjustment available in the back uh, through these cams right here. What we've been hearing is um, some folks getting up to about 2 degrees of negative camber in the rear. Most everybody's getting 1.6 to 1.8. Uh, and... Um, Rear sway bar stock is is fixed, but as we mentioned before, there is a uh, an adjustable bar in the works from Brian Carcepts. Um, actually, Ed, uh, throw uh, throw the Carcepts webpage up there if you. It's K A K A R C E P T S, um, and I'm not sure exactly what his webpage is, but we'll throw a uh, throw a shout out to Brian out there who is. Who is doing some some good development on uh, on the, on these cars already? Um, rear brakes. Uh, here, let's let's pull pull the rear wheel off here. Take a look at the rear brakes. Oh, it's so high. By the way, thanks everybody for joining us uh, tonight on a, uh, a special off-schedule night for Grassroots Motorsports Live. We definitely appreciate it. Um, if you enjoy all the content on GRM Live every week, every Wednesday night, 9 p.m. is our usual time, uh, you can throw us a like on Facebook, throw us a share. Even more importantly, we love those shares, baby. That is, uh, that is how... That is the best way to uh, show us you care is to share. So, um, looks like a single piston in the rear. Is that one or two? No, it's two pi two piston. Yeah, two two piston caliper in the rear. Um, nothing particularly different from the SI going on in the rear. A little bit bigger brake package, but suspension-wise, basically the same arrangement as, uh, as the SI. Um, upper and lower control arm. Uh, camber adjustment back here. See if you have any. Okay, so you can actually adjust this arm and get a little bit of. Uh, where's that going to pivot? Okay, this is your camber adjustment right, right here. This arm here. This arm uh, you can move back and forth. And adjust your rear toe a little bit, so you've got you've got both camber and and toe adjustment in uh, in the rear there that you can you can play with to um, to tune a bit. So 
So Jared wants to know what parts of the car are carbon fiber, look like uh, the splitters. These are actually, these are actually molded plastic. This is probably like ABS or something. It is a, a carbon pattern. As far as actual carbon fiber, I don't, don't think you have, you have much actual carbon fiber on there. Um, so Ricardo says he's not feeling the electronic parking brake. Yeah, <laughs> it, uh, it, it definitely makes uh, doing handbrake turns a little bit less exciting and um, makes, uh, you know, makes, your, makes your, uh, your Rockford Files impressions not quite as exciting. Um, so talk about the brakes a little bit. We had, uh, we had some folks uh, uh, mention that the, the brakes um, don't seem like they are, they are as, as, uh, as big as they, they could be for a car with, uh, you know, track intentions. We've not seen that. The car is, it, it's not a particularly heavy car. It's a, you know, it's a 3,100 pound car. It's uh, among the, the cars in its class. If you're talking about stuff like the, um, the Golf R and the Subaru STI and, uh, you know, the, the Focus RS, it's got a couple hundred pounds at least on all of those cars. Um, so you, it, it doesn't really have the, the demands on the brakes that, that those cars do. When we did the, uh, the, the, the press launch for these cars, we did it at a track up in Montreal. So here, here, here's the way these, these, these press previews work. I bring a bunch of journalists to a racetrack and they go, okay, guys, here's the cars. Go out and do some laps and uh, bring them back, and then we'll get, uh, we'll get, get the next person loaded up and, and um, you know, send them on their way. And we've been to enough of these things where it's pretty easy to tell whether the handlers of the car are, are trying to preserve one function of, of the car or another. We went to, went to the, the launch for these things. Literally, it was... You get out of the car, and there'd be somebody right behind you waiting to get back in the car and go right back out on track. They were hot cycling these things one after another. The only thing they asked us not to do was to not set the parking brakes, you know, or or turn the car the cars off. They asked us to leave leave them running and not set the parking brakes. And other than that, it was you know uh, have at it, ladies and gentlemen. And we experienced no brake troubles. Uh, no overheating troubles. I know there are some folks out there that have had some cooling issues on track with a couple of these. We saw none of that at the press launches. And, uh, you know, the, the, the conspiracy theorists always say, well, they put together special cars for, for, for the press launches. No, they, they don't. That, I'm not saying that's never happened. Uh, I'm saying it's fairly easy to tell when that does happen, especially once you drive a production version. And there are no special cars at, at, at the press launch for this. Um, So let's, uh, let's back up a little bit here. Um, Ricardo wants to know about the, uh, the brake air cooling ducts. Yeah, we're, the, uh, there are brake air cooling ducts up front. They are, they are functional. Um, air intake right here, uh, exits in, in the wheel well here, ventilates the, these areas, uh, nothing in particular to the rear. Um, shh, shh. Okay, question from uh, somebody watching over on YouTube. Um, wants to know if the bushings are better on the Type R than on the other sub models for the Civic. Um, the, the answer is yes, in some cases, uh, in, in other cases, when you, when you say bushings as a package, uh, some are, some aren't. As far as a list of exactly which ones are, are, are different, that I can't tell you. I, I, I can tell you that um, Honda did a lot of highly specific tuning for, uh, for, for this car, and they were not shy. Um, again, this is according to the media materials that we get and direct conversations with people that work at Honda. Uh, they were they were liberal with their use of 
different durometer bushings, different design bushings in various, uh, in, in various um, positions. If I was going to guess, if I was going to take an educated guess on exactly which ones uh, that was, I would say uh, more than likely the engine mount bushings are probably considerably different on this car than they are on the SI. Uh, certainly with a different arrangement front suspension, uh, it's going to be a lot different. And I'd say probably the, the trailing bushing back here for this trailing control arm is, is quite a bit different because there's a lot of different torque loads going through that front suspension. Uh, so the, if I was going to guess, the, those would be the ones, um, the ones I would definitely guess. All right. Uh, oh, uh, Ormond uh, wants to know about issues with transmission shifting as reported by several owners. The only issues that we've heard about shifting, we haven't heard any issues with bind. I, you know, if, if they are happening out there, I haven't heard about them, but uh, we've heard issues with grinding into second gear. And we've heard that those issues can be alleviated, uh, if not entirely eliminated, by just changing your timing on the clutch and the shifter a little bit. You go to the clutch a little earlier, pull, pull the shifter a little bit later, and just apparently the, the, the attack curve for the clutch um, works a little bit more favorably that, that way. So we've actually uh, talked to people that said, yes, we got some grinding issues going into second gear, especially with a hot transmission. Maybe not, like if you're autocrossing, maybe not you know, on, on your first run, but if you're making hot laps back to back, uh, maybe that one-two shift starts to grind on about your third or fourth fourth back-to-back -back run. Um, but that can be alleviated by changing your driving habits just slightly. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Okay, um, so we're going to wrap up here pretty soon, but we've gotten a couple questions about personal preference, uh, Type R, Focus RS. Um, you know, it, look, if, if you're asking me personally, I, I, I look at four cars. I look at Type R, Focus RS, uh, Subaru WRX STI, and Golf R. If you're wanting me to just rank those personal preference, uh, I'm going to put the STI at the bottom because it's, it's the oldest car of, of those, or it's the, sort of the least sophisticated car. It's kind of the least, it's the numbest car of, of those. Uh, I'm going to put the Focus RS in, in third place because the Focus RS, you need to be a very specific shape and very specific leg length uh, to, to fit in those cars properly. And they also, again, they, they on, now on dirt, they're magic. They're ab Focus RS on dirt, loose surfaces, gravel, grass, absolute brilliant magic. On pavement, eh, you know, it, it's, it's not that exciting. This and the Golf R, I think, stand uh, ahead above both those cars, especially on, on, on pavement. They are both fantastic driver's cars. They're both extremely comfortable. Uh, they, they both do not really make you pay a price for using them every day. They're both cars that can be fantastically comfortably used every day. Uh, I think by the time you drive out of a dealership, even though dealers are still charging a little bit extra for these cars, you can get them fairly close to, uh, to sticker price. And once the 2018s come out, it's probably not really going to be much of a premium at all. You're going to be able to drive away with one of these cheaper than I think you are a comparably equipped Golf R. So uh, I, if, if, if there's a couple of keys for, for me, for, for my, my person, and your feelings may vary, but my personal preference is uh, I, I have a, I, I got a real, real deep love and affection for this car because for the, mo the, the main reason is so much of its performance is so accessible to any driver. Uh, you, you, can, you can hop into one of these cars and go fast instantly. And that is, that is a very, very difficult thing to engineer into a car. Um, Uh, Nick wants to know about rallycross potential. Um, man, I, w I, I, I wish I could uh, answer that more intelligently. I, I, w I would say you're going to have some ground clearance issues right off uh, in, in, in rallycross, especially with, with all of this, this uh, plastic aerodynamic add-on stuff down here. I think, uh, I think this would disappear pretty quickly and pretty expensively in, in a rallycross. Um, the overall chassis is, is quite good, though. I think if you got... You build some ground clearance into it. It's got uh, you know a, a nice 
it, it's nicely proportioned wheelbase versus track for uh, for something like that and the front diff is actually very very good at putting the power down so um, you know it, it, if you want to take your thirty five thousand dollar Honda Civic out to a rallycross more power to you brother um, I would I would probably keep it on pavement uh, at least till the warranty runs out <laughs> but that's just me uh, do, 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 do. Todd wants to know about uh, Dialing out the understeer of the Type R be easier than the Golf R. You know, when you're talking about dialing anything out, kind of, kind of car to car. Uh, I, I do know that the folks that have been testing the prototype rear sway bars on these cars have reported uh, nothing but, but success in, in putting a, a, a little bit heavier rear sway bar on these cars. They're reporting a, lot, a, lot, a car that's already very, quite nimble and, uh, and actually reacts very well to steering inputs. Uh, becoming just that much more nimble, so I, I think um, I think that's probably a good thing overall. All right, folks, uh, this has been a very very long show. I got uh, poor Chris over here has been holding holding the steady cam for over an hour, so we're going to give his back a break. We're going to go ahead and sign off here. Thank you so much for watching our very special episode on a Monday night. Thanks for thanks for joining us. We're going to be back again on Wednesday with our regular edition of Grassroots Motorsports Live, presented by CRC Industries. Terry Irwood will be our guest, and I uh, hope everybody joins us on uh, Wednesday the 25th. And if, again, if you're watching this on Facebook, thank you so much for all the likes and all the shares, especially if you're watching us on YouTube, go ahead and go down here and throw us a subscribe, because uh, we got great content going up all the time on the Grassroots Motorsports YouTube channel. And if you're watching this anytime other than live, uh, you know, you missed it. You, you missed your chance to ask questions. Hope you enjoyed the video nonetheless. But check out all of our great live shows every Wednesday, 9 p.m. Eastern at the Grassroots Motorsports Facebook and YouTube Hub. Ah, oh, folks, long show tonight, but fun stuff. Thanks for hanging out with us. I'm JG Pastor Jack. This is the Honda Civic Type R. Big shout out to uh, Ed Higginbotham, Chris Rapea, who have been uh, diligently working behind the camera over here. And big shout out to everybody out there watching us every week. We, we, we love you. We appreciate it. it. It's so much fun hanging out with you guys and answering questions. And uh, we will see you again on Wednesday. Good night, everybody.